um, Professor Dr. J. Lu and dear participants. Welcome to another nice webinar on how do Americans view the rising China. Let me briefly introduce Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement. Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement is an independent, apolitical, and non-partisan think tank which believes in freedom, democracy, and world free from conflict. We envision a world where sources of insecurity are identified and understood, conflicts are prevented or resolved, and peace is advocated. China Study is one of our major research center. China studies as a whole brings into perspective uh, rising China's mounting economic, military, and diplomatic cloud that certainly has the aptitude to either overturn or sustain the current contemporary world order. The center broadly examines China's international strategic thinking and conduct, foreign and security policy, and the impact of domestic politics and economy on China's foreign relations. It further addresses China's emergence in the face of the world in flux, domestic politics, economy, society, culture, People's Liberation Army and Tibet Autonomous Region, and most importantly, her engagement with each of South Asian countries. To talk on a very interesting topic of today, we have Professor Dr. J. Lu. Professor Dr. J. Lu is a NSI Chair of Chair Professor at School of International Studies of Renmin University, Beijing. He holds his PhD in political science from Duke University. Previously, he worked as Associate Professor at Department of Government at American University, where he, where he was involved in research related to local governance, the political economy of institutional change, public opinion, and political participation. His, his regional expertise focused on the greater China region and East Asia. His works has appeared in comparative political science, comparative politics, political psychology, politics and society, political communication, uh, Journal of Democracy, and many other journals. He is the author of Variety of Governance in China, Migration and Institutional Change, in Chinese Villages, which was published by uh, Oxford University Press, New York in 2015. Professor Jay Lu, please make your presentation in 30 minutes, which will be followed by question and answers. The program is streaming live on Facebook. I'd like to request all our participants to drop their questions in the chat box or comment below Facebook Live. Please also tweet about this event uh, at Contact Nights. Professor Lu, over to you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you first to Dr. Jasper for this invitation to give this presentation on how Americans view rising in China. Uh, just to be clear that, so I have 40 minutes for presentation, right? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen. So again, this is a, this is a very uh, brief kind of a summarized uh, presentation of our research over the past 10 years. I've been working together with some of my Chinese and American colleagues to collect public opinion data from the US regarding how the American public views China from different perspectives. Uh, today, I'm going to uh, present some of the findings uh, in the subsequent uh, sections. So first, first, I'm going to briefly address uh, the background in the US, especially increasing uh, polarization. Then I'm going to present some evidence regarding the significance of China issue for American electoral politics. Move on to with some introduction about longitudinal data that I've collected for this kind of dynamic examination of how American views China starting from the first wave of survey in 2010 until the last wave of survey in 2020. Then we're going to more specifically examine how the US uh, citizens assess China's overall image, as well as the specific image from different perspectives. Then I'm going to explore some of the sort of underlying possible uh, dynamics, then with some preliminary conclusions and implications for this. So it's not surprising to tell you that a whole American politics uh, has experienced increasing polarization. This is uh, nothing new to anyone for interest in American politics. To so just give you some brief ideas using the data collected by different survey institutes in China, you see the American public has been uh, gradually pulling toward two ends of this ideological spectrum. So see uh, more Democrats moving toward end of being uh, consistent liberal and Republican pulling to the end of being consistently more Republican. This is not just about this kind of uh, conservative liberal uh, ideological spectrum when it comes to various issues as well as 
affective identity, the literature has identified an increasing level of polarization. This is extremely important to keep in mind as a background, because when we come to examine American public's views of China, given this rising level of political polarization, it's very difficult to simply assume that American public is a simple monolithic body is going to be examined as different groups because they demonstrate different dynamics when it comes to views of China. So next, just give you some ideas of uh, the issue of mobilization in the most recent uh, presidential election in 2020. Given this competition between two uh, candidates, uh, Trump and Biden, and you see, especially when you examine their talks and speeches, in their mobilization for votes, they target different dimensions of various issues. And according to the polling data from American Survey Institutes, you find that Republicans and Democrats actually pay varying attentions to various issues. For instance, when it comes to healthcare, right? And you see the Biden supporters, 84% Biden supporters pay more attention to health issues, where only 48% of the Trump supporters pay attention to health issues. It's more important for us to focus on foreign policy. As you see in this table, it's, it's an, a surprising outlier compared to other issues. Close to 57% of both Biden and Trump supporters pay attention to foreign policy. The foreign policy is not just simply about China. The foreign policy is about Middle East policy, about American policy toward traditional allies like Japan, South Korea, as well as European countries. So comparatively speaking, you find this relatively consensus among Democrats and Republicans in terms of silence of foreign policy issues when it comes to uh, selecting uh, which candidate should be the next president. But there's way more differences sort of hidden behind this kind of consensus in terms of silence of issues. Now we move to the media. Uh, pro media coverage salience as a proxy. This is a data collected from New York Times in terms of the uh, topics they covered in their daily news coverage. And the right line stands for any news coverage related to China, the green one related to Russia, and the blue one related to econ economic issues. So this is, this is uh, another way to demonstrate the varying salience of uh, China issue using newspaper coverage as a proxy. And you find that there are spikes in terms of intensity of coverage regarding China-related issues. Actually, these spikes, they collapse really well with the presidential elections. So from the mass perspective, this is a data collected from Google in terms of Google search interest, right? China, Russia, economy as the keywords to see when the American people are more likely to search for online information about China, about Russia, about the economy, again, you, you say there are being spikes that collapse uh, sort of uh, coincides really well with the presidential election. To say, in most cases, either in the 2012 election or in the 2016 election, China issue clearly not most salient issue for American public. It's usually economic issues. It's only in the most recent presidential election, 2020 election, you see the research interest in China written new spikes move to the very top. So clearly this is something indicating the political mobilization effects on how American people are interested in China related issues. We also got some data from uh, self-reported interest in China related issues. This is the data collected from the waves of surveys that I'm going to introduce later. As you can see, starting from 2014, the American people's reported interest in China retail issue moves gradually from about 33, 34% to 55, 56%, with an increase of 20%. And this is, this is huge as compared to their interest in many other foreign policy issues, but clearly, this kind of interest in China issues as compared to many domestic issues is not that high, but clearly the China issue, the salience of the China issue has been increasing among the American public. If you keep in mind the first slides about polarization, right? Do Republicans and Democrats differ in terms of interest in China related issues? Yes, they do. Sorry, it's not moving. 
So here we separate American people according to their self-reported party partisanship. And you find in most cases, the differences between Republicans and Democrats are not that dramatic, but exceptional case is the 2020, where I see dramatic difference and a statistical significant difference between Republican and Democrats where Republicans lead in terms of self-report interest in China. And this is not just a seeing here as a gap in the descriptive evidence. One, we run regression models to account for many other confounding variables and you find that difference between the Republican and Democrats is only statistically significant for the 2020 survey. So earlier, the difference between Republicans and Democrats in terms of whether they are interested in China related use is not statistically meaningful after accounting for their differences in terms of age, gender, education, income, things like that. But in 2020, even after accounting for those issues, Republicans still way more likely to pay interest in China related news. So this is the background to demonstrate that a kind of salience issue of China related has been to some extent clearly politically mobilized. So now move to the key piece of information that we, we pay attention to. This is a very sort of brief background information about the surveys. So I've been working together with my Chinese and American colleagues to collect the data starting from 2010. This is the first wave of data using computer assisted telephone interviews. And then later on, we switched to these web-based surveys with matched representative sample. All these surveys are done by academic survey uh, research institutes in the United, United States with very high academic uh, quality. So in terms of representation, there's, uh, there's been uh, cross-validation studies done to demonstrate all these samples are clearly representative of the American public in general. And now in terms of the key instruments we use to measure, the first one is the general image. Basically we're asking American people for how, how positive, how warm or cold they feel toward China, use the traditional feeling thermometer running from zero to 100. Instead of simply asking for their feeling toward China, we also ask the feelings toward Russia, India, and Japan for comparison. So this is the general image assessment. We also have specific image assessment covering both economic, culture, domestic, and international dimensions of China. So in terms of economic, we ask for their assessment of China's economic competitiveness, China's potential manipulation of currency policy, and attractiveness of China's pop popular culture as the richness of China's cultural heritage. Domestic politics, we're asking whether to perceive the Chinese government is trying their best to serve the people's needs and promote and protect people's political rights. In terms of international dimension, they have been asked to see whether China has been serving its international responsibility and as well as China's international influence. So from eight different uh, perspectives, we, we, asking, we ask the American public to provide their assessment of China. And all these specific image, actually they are just using traditional five point Likert scale. And the time is starting from the 2012 to 2020. Now the data. So first we checked average reading. Uh, this is a weighted readings using the feeling thermometer of an American people's view of the general image of China. As you see the circle stands for China, the triangle stands for Japan, the square for India, and uh, uh, the, pl uh, the, the plus line stands for Russia. So as you can see, comparatively speaking, American people's feeling toward Japan is much warmer as compared to China, and so does their views toward India. It's most years, their average reading or feeling thermometer toward Japan and India is above the 50, which is the middle point. Or China, in most cases, and below the 50, where in most cases, their reading or their feelings toward China is even lower. So this is the, just a simple average situation where you can see as compared to Japan, India, and Russia, where well, China stands in terms of American people's overall image. So instead of just look at the average reading with just a point estimation of the American public's views of China, we can also check the distribution of the whole American public's feeling thermometer toward China. This is the sort of a density plot of the distribution of their feeling toward China. 
as you can see, we move from 2010 to 2020. The distribution of their feeling toward China gradually moved from one unimodal distribution, as you can see in 2010, that's just one peak, which looks relatively symmetric as compared to a normal distribution. And when you move to 2020, the distribution moved to into a distribution with multiple uh, modes. This is an interesting sort of a finding, which indicating the possible ongoing polarization among the people, right? Pull, pulling people toward uh, into different directions instead of pushing them moving into the same central tendency. So this is the first impression you get when you check the distribution of the American people's overall feeling toward China. Now, we check into the partisan differences. So we first cut all these average ratings into two groups, one rating average rating for the Democrats, one average rating for the Republicans. As you can see, for in terms of feeling toward Japan and Russia, there's really no big significant differences between Democrats and Republicans when it comes to feeling toward Japan and, uh, Japan and India. But there are significant differences, noticeable differences when it comes to their views of China, especially the gap the big gap, as you can see in the figure in 2020. And it's the Republicans who had much lower feelings toward China as compared to their Democrats. Although both groups, their feelings toward China is below 50, which is relatively cold, but just the Republicans much colder. And when we move to this kind of regression-based diagnosis of partisan differences after counting for all these potential confounding variables between Republicans and Democrats, you find before 2016, despite this kind of consistent difference between Democrats and Republicans, that magnitude of the difference doesn't change dramatically. But 2020, it dropped significantly. But that again indicating potential kind of political process, right? It's moving on. And the same. And now the distribution. Now you here see the black color stands for the distribution of feeling thermometer toward China among the Republicans, while the green ones stand for the distribution of the feeling thermometer toward China among Democrats. So if you check the distribution, you'll find actually this multi-mode distribution is primarily driven by the move of the Republicans rather than the Democrats. So the Republicans move quite frequently over the years. As you can see in 2012, 2015, and uh, uh, 2020, the Republicans moved dramatically to the left. But interestingly, in 2017, the two distributions overlapped greatly. But what happened in 2017? President Trump visited China. Right? That was the kind of best part of the Sino-US relations when Trump assumed the pres presidency. But after 2010, things going on with the trade wars, all kinds of sanctions, and all these kind of blaming games played by the president against China. And you say the Republicans responded very quickly. But the Democrats, despite its gradual move toward the left, which means colder views toward China, but is relatively civil across the years in terms of the distribution. So this is another interesting indicator of this partisan dynamics going on when it comes to American public's views of China. So earlier we talked about these general views of China, now move to very specific dimensions when it comes to American people's assessment of China's economy, culture, domestic politics, and international behavior. As you can see, majority of American public, when it comes to the competitiveness of China's economy, the majority of the public agree that China's economy is really competitive. So they, they do perceive the objective prosperity of economic growth in China. But when it comes to China's intention in terms of policy, uh, currency manipulation for advantage in international trade, you see the assessment is quite negative. So close to 80% around of the surveyed American public believe China engaged in some sort of currency manipulation for its own advantage. When it comes to popular culture and cultural heritage, surprisingly you'll find the majority of American public hold quite positive views of the cultural dimension of China. Uh, actually, their assessment of popular culture of China has been increasing uh, over the past 10 years. 
well, the assessment of the richness of China's cultural heritage has been quite stable over time. Comparatively speaking, the American people's assessment of China's performance in serving its own people's needs and promote and protect the people's political rights has been quite negative consistently over the years, right? The majority, close to 80% of the Soviet American public, actually, they believe China did not effectively serve the people's needs, and they don't think China effectively protect and promote its people's political rights. So this is a political dimension. When it comes to international dimension, you find the American people does recognize the growing influence of China in international community. So the majority of the American people believe China enjoy a high level of international influence. But when it comes to why does China serve its international responsibility or dodges international responsibility? The majority of the American people actually think, believe that China has been dodging its international responsibility. So you find a very interesting kind of multidimensional uh, views of different aspects of China. So the American people do observe on average some good economic performance, right? the counter-attractiveness, as well as China's growing international influence. But when it comes to China's domestic politics, its intentions in dealing with foreign countries, their assessment has been relatively negative. And again, we find partisan differences. And the partisan differences were noticed the most in terms of their views of China's uh, uh, serving international responsibility uh, as culture performance as well as economic performance. And one way, again, using regression models to help us diagnose that kind of partisan differences is you find over the time, the Republicans and Democrats diverge increasingly in terms of their views of how China serves international responsibility in terms of uh, their culture performance. But the Republicans and Democrats actually they hold some sort of consensus in terms of China's domestic political performance. So this is the sort of the situation we have now uh, when, America, when it comes to American people's views of different aspects of China, as well as China's overall image among American people. Now the next question is, how can we understand this, right? As China's overall image going down, then there's increasing sort of a a divergence between Republicans and Democrats in terms of assessment. So basically taking advantage of uh, statistical modeling, we run regressions for each wave and then uh, using all these specific assessment as indicators to predict their overall image of China. So over the years, we specify the same model and to see for each year, which aspects, specific, assess, ass specific as aspect assessment is significant in predicting their overall image of China. And all these cells with stars indicating a sig significant influence or correlation between a specific assessment and the overall image. And the consistently you find four specific aspect assessment had dramatic influence over American people's overall image of China. Culture dimension, two culture components, political, uh, popular culture and culture heritage, and the extent to which Chinese government serves people's needs, and also the extent to which China serves international responsibility. And we zoom in to focus on these four uh, aspects and understand their respective influence within Republicans and Democrats. As you can see, the influence of a popular culture assessment, uh, China's popular culture assessment on their overall image has been decreasing over the time among both Republicans and Democrats. China's culture heritage, how American people view this. This, in, this components influence overall image of China has been quite consistent over the time among Republicans, but its influence among the Democrats has been increasing over the time. So over the time, the better views of China's culture heritage for a Democrat in China, uh, the much better overall image they hold. For, for China. And when it comes to China's performance in serving its people's needs, you see the influence had been quite consistent over the time. And it's roughly the same between the Democrats and Republicans, but impact is significantly higher among 
Republicans. So Republicans are more responsive to this, to their assessment of China in so many people's needs uh, and translate that kind of assessment into their overall image of China. The last component is their views of China's so means international responsibility. Again, over the time, these factors influence has been increasing for both Republicans and Democrats. Nevertheless, its influence is much higher among, among Republicans. It's important for you to keep in mind that comparatively speaking, the American people's assessment of the, of the China so means local people's needs has been quite negative and consistently over the time. So if this factor has been consistently significant in shaping their overall image of China, that kind of negative trend is understandable. And also their views of China's uh, uh, performance in serving its international community, international responsibility has been relatively negative over time. And so Republicans are more responsive to that kind of change and assessment and their overall image of China has been even uh, more negative it's also understandable given the findings here. Now we're going to move from this very broad general multitude of studies to zooming in and focus on two major events that has been covered in our survey data. So first one is Obama 2012 presidential election and also Trump 2020 presidential election. The reason we choose these two major events is they offer much similarities for a very effective comparison. So the candidates, the leading candidates are different. The one is the, the incumbent president in 2012 is a Democrat, while in 2020 is a Republican. And all these, serve, all these happened at the end of their first term, which means these incumbents, they tried their best to mobilize for uh, their electoral victory for a second term. And a survey happened before the presidential election campaigns, which means if we are going to compare the influence of electoral politics on um, how the American people views of China, these two scenarios offer the best sort of opportunities for do that kind of comparative study. And what do we find? So this is the information we collected from respondents regarding their assessment uh, of how the American government uh, respond to China. The first one asked whether they believe the trade war should harm China more, the US more. The second is whether they believe China is an enemy or ally. The third is whether they think the government uh, has been tough enough in their dealings with China. So as you can see, right, uh, there has been significant increase the percentage of Americans believe that the trade war harms China more if you compare the 2012 and the 2020 survey. So over the past eight years, in eight years in between, there is an increase of 20 plus percent of American people believe the trade war harm should have China more. And also there is an increase of around 10% saying China should be regarded as an enemy of the US. But there's a significant decrease in terms of the percentage American believe their government has not been tough enough in dealing with China. So the black column stand for the situation in Obama administration at the end of the first term, when the green bar stands for the, the Trump administration at the end of the first term. If we decompose that again into two groups, and you find that a kind of dramatic move actually probably happened among the Republicans. Okay. So you compare the situation of the Republicans between Obama 12 and Trump 20, you find the increase of the percentage of people who believe the trade war should harm China more comes primarily from Republicans. The increase of the percentage of American people who believe China should be an enemy comes dramatically from the Republicans. And the decrease of the percentage of Americans who believe the president is not tough enough in dealing with China again comes primarily from the Republicans. So this is very interesting kind of partisan dynamics that we observe. When it comes to average ratings, when it comes to specific aspects, as again, when it comes to their assessment of government responses to China. So 
And it, again, we use the risk models to demonstrate why that kind of funding is statistically significant. You find it has always been the case, except for when it comes to assessing the government's toughness in dealing with China in 2020. There's no significant difference between Republicans and Democrats in assessing whether the government has been not tough enough in dealing with China. In other words, both Democrats and Republicans, the majority of them, believe the government has been tough enough in dealing with China. So remember, that is President Trump. Right? Earlier, when it comes to President Obama, you see the Republicans and Democrats differ in terms of assessment. Given that, that kind of amount of data presented, what we have learned? First, politically polarized and rising salience of China, as we say, using either media coverage data or use the individual mass search data that uh, can be easily identified in American society. And also, the politically mobilized and grow interest in China-related China issues in both Republicans and Democrats, but clearly Republicans outperformed Democrats in this regard, they reported a much higher level of interest in China-related issues, especially in 2020. And when it comes to overall image of China, you see over the past 20 years, starting from 2010 to 2020, we see a declining overall popularity of China among Americans. When it comes to distribution, as we say, in that kind of overall popularity, we find that kind of fluctuated polarization in the overall popularity of China. But that kind of fluctuation, that kind of polarization, mainly driven by the move of the Republicans. So in other words, the Republicans have been much more responsive to the elites and politicians' mobilization over China-related issues, while the Democrats have been relatively stable despite their gradual deterioration in that kind of overall rating, uh, overall feelings toward China. This is the first, what we have learned overall. Second, so the data actually suggests that the American public perceived China as a country with rising economic power, rising international influence, as well as somewhat attractive culture. These are some sort of relatively objective features of Chinese society or the Chinese government that they perceive, they perceive. But on the other hand, the majority of American public actually perceive China to be a country with bad intentions when dealing with both domestic and international issues. They do not believe the Chinese government is serving its people's needs. They do not believe that they engage in a performance to protect, promote their political rights. And they do see China as being dodging its international responsibility. So if we combine these two dimensions together, you can find that Majority of the American people, American public see China as a growing but vicious power. So their assessment of the objective performance, they say is good. But when it comes to assessment of China's intentions, in most cases it has been negative. But we all know that the intention assessment part is fully subjective to potential mobilization, framing, and agenda setting and manipulation. Uh, that could be uh, used by politicians in their electoral campaigns and domestic politics. Now, when it comes to specific, uh, how does specific assessment affect overall, pop overall popularity of China in public? You find a consistent impact of China's culture, domestic politics, and international uh, behavior. Oh, the culture part, especially Chinese culture heritage, actually plays an unexpected but rising uh, role in China, especially Democrats' views of China. This is something usually uh, unexpected and conventionally not discussed in, in, in this kind of uh, Sino-US relation dynamic. In most cases, people focus on economic competition, military competition, and geopolitics issues, but surprisingly, when it comes to public opinion data, you find actually how the American people view China's culture heritage plays consistently significant and a positive role in shaping their overall popularity of China. And this is especially salient among the Democrats. The influence of domestic issues has been quite consistent and it's much stronger among the Republicans, 
Nevertheless, their overall assessment of China's performance in serving people's needs and protecting their political rights has been consistently negative over the past 10 years. Similar findings can be uh, identified in terms of the influence of China's performance in serving national responsibility and on its overall, uh, overall image in a modern American public. So some ne relatively negative assessment about China's performance in domestic politics, China's performance in international community uh, on their overall image has been much more significant observed among the Republicans. That can be easily translated into that kind of growing gap between the Democrats and Republicans when it comes to overall popularity. Now, another interesting finding we got by comparing the 2012 and 2020 situation, you find the Republicans rising willingness to engage a trade war with China. They are growing hostility toward China. They dramatically changed between these two, two, time, two time points. Well, the Democrats has been relatively stable in terms of intentions in engaging in trade war with China in terms of uh, hostility toward China. Uh, when it comes to assessment of government's toughness in dealing with China, you find Trump's performance has been widely perceived and to some extent appreciated among both Republicans and Democrats in terms of toughness in dealing with China. Again, here, the change we find American public's assessment of the government's performance in dealing with China, that kind of fluctuation comes dramatically and mostly from the Republicans rather than the Democrats. So these are the basic findings we got from the survey data. And again, we see a very complicated and multidimensional phenomenon when it comes to American people's views of China. It's not easy to draw just a one sentence conclusion to see what it is and what may happen. But what would have been implications of this for our assessment of Sino-US relations uh, as time move on? Should we be more optimistic or pessimistic? For me, it really depends. It depends on the extent to which the politicians might be respond to that kind of popular sentiment. It also depends on the part of public sentiment regarding China could be potentially manipulated and changed by the elite's political discourse and gender setting. So clearly the fluidity in American Republicans assessment of China is a key factor here. Will that be up for change? Will Joe Biden enjoy more advantage in shipping that, that section of American society as compared to uh, a Republican president? Or given the gradual deterioration in the Democrats' related views, is Joe Biden or the President Biden able to generate some possible reversion? These are something we don't know. We need to wait and say. And the existing scholarship on the political polarization in the United States actually has demonstrated over the past 10 years. Republicans are the ones that plays the driving force, the major driving force in generate political polarization. And clearly the partisan politics played out in different ways for the Democrats and Republicans. We need more research to understand uh, how the two groups of Americans respond to politicians' cues and a message and the discourse manipulation when it comes to foreign policies, especially regarding China. Another interest finding we got from analyzing the data is what could be the potential role played by public diplomacy in shaping these two major powers bilateral relations. Remember, cultural heritage, especially American people's assessment of that part, has been playing increasingly important role, especially among the Democrats in their overall popularity, in their overall assessment of China, right? But given the kind of situation now we have, especially with the extra challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, it's not very optimistic to say the public diplomacy can play much, can say much, or do much to change that kind of popular sentiment in, in the United States. So here today, I simply present some of the findings from the surveys we collected from the past 10 years. 
And the key message we got from this is partisan politics, political polarization is not just something we observe in American domestic politics. When it comes to their views of China, they play a role. And this kind of very interesting uh, varying dynamics among Republicans and Democrats should be should be paid, should should merit further research when it comes to how public opinion might be connected to the dynamics in China U.S. relations. So I think my time is up. I should stop here. It's already forty minutes, and I'll I'll get everything back to Doctor Abajal so you can move on with the next step. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. Thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Uh, we have immensely benefited from the lecture. Uh, I'm sure our participant, participants have also learned a lot from it. Uh, we have received lots of questions. I'm trying to club them together because there are lots of similar questions. So let me move to the first question. I'll try to get in a set of two or three. Uh, is there a huge change in the American view towards China with the change in government, which you have partially addressed? Uh, if yes, what are those changes? Uh, how is President Xi viewed in China compared to the previous Chinese presidents? That is one set of questions. Second, oh, can, you, can you repeat that? I, I, there is an internet connection problem. I didn't hear it. Okay. Uh, there are a few questions that I've clubbed. One is, is there a change in American view towards China with the change in government? If yes, mm -hmm. what are those changes? And another is how is Chinese President Xi viewed in China, uh, viewed in America compared to previous Chinese presidents? So the first question is, is there a change in how American view China as the change of the government, right? So yeah. change move from, from Trump to Biden, how will that affect their change of views of China? Yeah. Well, I we are collecting the most recent wave of survey data. So maybe after a month, I can come back, show the data to see whether there will be significant change. But clearly, based on a comparison with 2012 survey and 2020 survey, you find the change, the switch of the government from Republican Democrats plays some role here. And especially when it comes to assessment of governments dealing with China, the government and the both Republican and Democrats say the government has been much tougher when it comes to a president administration, uh, Trump administration in dealing with China as compared to the assessment of Obama administration. But over the time, you find the general trend in their overall image of China has been deteriorating, right? So this is the same trend we find among both Republicans and Democrats. It's just that the difference is, the change is much more dramatic for the Republicans as compared to the Democrats. And clearly, we see one interesting uh, sort of outlier that is observed in 2017, where both Republicans and Democrats moved a little bit to the right with a relatively more positive kind of change. But that, that was the only change we observed in 2017, then he moved back again to the, to the negative trend. But if that is the critical case we can use for analysis, we find what happened in 2017 is exactly the major visit right, of Pre President Trump to China and related changes in the media discourse about China. So clearly, if we use that as a critical case for assessment, we find that the American public opinion is up to uh, manipulation and this kind of agenda setting and framing from their lips. Yeah. Uh, let me move to the second question. I'm trying to club three questions again. How do Americans view China? How is it different from other Asian countries like Japan, India, Korea, and Singapore? I think you addressed during this presentation. Another is uh, during your presentation, it was shown that China and Russia are viewed in a similar manner. So what might be the reason for China being viewed very similar to Russians? So the first question when it comes to how American views of China differ from Asian neighbors' views of China. We do not have the data in this presentation to demonstrate that. So if you want to compare uh, the general views of the uh, China's Asian neighbors as compared to American views of China, clearly we need comparable instruments in the service collected from all of these countries. I believe one data set you may find related information is the Asian Barometer Survey to cover 13 Asian societies where they do have uh, instruments like uh, the Asian people's percep perceptions of China's influence in this region to see whether it's good or bad. So maybe you can check it out to see whether it's comparable to the findings I found here.
but I do not have the information on hands to address the concerns they just raised. Yeah. Uh, let me move to another set of questions. Um, uh, sorry. Yes. Uh, the other question is that uh, with the end of poverty in China, has it improved its image in the United States? Uh, that is first. And second is, do Americans consider China as a rising power, which is going to compete with the United States in the future? I didn't hear the first part, but I can try the second one first. Well, in terms of their views of China as a rising power, clearly you can see in the data, they know China's economic performance is competitive. They know the influence of China, international community is rising. They do see China as a rising power. This is not just among the mass. When it comes to the elites, I don't think I need to direct you to any media coverage to say the elites perceive China to be a potential threat to the US. I mean, given the most recent uh, memos published by the American government, you do say um, the majority of the elites perceive China to be a rising threat to the US in terms of the supreme status of the US in the global community. So I, I don't think this there's been any sort of a misunderstanding or, or, or a disagreement over that. But when it comes to their assessment of China's intentions, right? This is where it it, it is way more important. Despite they see the growing capacity and the growing strength of China, but when it comes to when it's through, when it comes to their assessment of China's intentions in dealing with domestic issues and international issues, they do not see China as a benign power, right? So they say they do not they do not affect civil people's needs, they do not protect and, and promote China, people's rights. And China has been dodging its international responsibility. So all these intention aspect assessment has been quite negative over the years and has been quite consistent among both Republicans and Democrats. Uh, let me repeat the first question that you missed. Like with the end of poverty in China, uh, as it has improved, has it improved its image in the United States? Uh, that is one. Second. Will Sino-American conflict in South China Sea lead to a war if tension get worse? There's another purely political question if you want to address. And another is, does the end of Trump administration also mark the end of US-China trade war? Or should we expect it to continue continuous under a less aggressive banner under Biden? Well, both questions actually should be better directed to my colleagues who study geopolitics and international relations. I'm a comparative politics guy. I focus on the micro dimensions of the public opinion, political dynamics change. So for me, I can just make editing a guess, right? So I, I do not have that kind of professional expertise to provide a very comprehensive an analysis of either the South China Sea issue or the trade war issue. But given, given all the statements from the US governments, even from the Biden administration, we do say actually that kind of competition in both economic domain and military domain is going to be sustained for an extended period of time. I, at least I don't expect that it's going to be any dramatic change in a short period of time. So there has been some sort of consensus among both Republicans and Democrats, especially among the elites, when it comes to how to deal with China. Otherwise, that kind of strategic, strategic plan will not be announced by the government. And the trade war issue, there might be minor adjustments in terms of how to deal with China, but that kind of competitive status, that kind of mindset, I think will be will be with the American government for extended period of time. So that's that's just my guess. I again, I'm not expert on international relations. So I don't uh, I don't do extensive research in that field. So I can just offer my personal views. Yeah. Um, there's another question. Like, do you agree with the rise of China in global politics? China has been attacked more aggressively by the United States, which is hurting its image. Sorry, the last part. Uh, do you agree that with the rise of China in global politics, China is being attacked more aggressively by the US, which is hurting China's image? So asking whether China has been attacked more aggressively by the US and hurting China's image? Yes. So well, for me, I mean, since the data only taps the American public's views of China, we do not have any global kind of mapping of what's really going on in different regions. 
I can see if we only talk about China's image in the United States, clearly what the American government, what American politicians do in their domestic uh, mobilization, uh, especially when it comes to these kind of electoral campaigns, leaves significant imprints over American people's views of China. When it comes to other regions, I, I used to have a co-authored piece with, with my American colleague in Aldrich and Duke University, trying to understand this kind of global mapping of views of China in both Latin America, Africa, and Middle East and East Asia. And we find actually it's really regional political and economic dynamics and shapes that a kind of image of China in different regions. It's, it's very unlikely to be simply trade everything back to the US attack, right? So domestic or the local media coverage, local political dynamics, local economic ecology, and even China's investment projects in its regions and what China do in its regions, how they approach that kind of cooperation and investments regions all have significant influence over a local people's views of China. Yeah. Uh, there's another reverse question that, how do Chinese view the United States? Is there a change in US view in China in recent times? Sorry, I, not a catching issue. The question is reverse, like how do Chinese view the United States of America? And is there oh. a change in US oh. view in China? Okay, so yeah, uh, again, I do not have the data as my hand, so I cannot uh, answer your question, but uh, according, to, according to a work I did back in 2010, with the data collected from two major cities in China, we find actually the Chinese people's views of the United States has been bifurcated. So when it comes to institution, when it comes to technology, education, culture, majority of the urban Chinese people actually hold very positive views of China, of the United States. Well, when it comes to American foreign policy, according to international behavior of the US, especially US policy toward China, the majority of the urban Chinese actually hold very negative views of the US. So clearly you can see, again, the, the, the popular sentiment is not unidimensional monolithic. It's very complicated and multi-dimensional. Yeah. But I do not have more recent data to see whether that changes. But um, according to some of the survey research in the China field, there has been a rising level of nationalism in China, especially among the urban Chinese. So if you take that kind of theoretically expected correlation between rising nationalism and um, kind of their views of foreign countries as granted for are making predictions, I think that might be some noticeable changes over the time. But whether that is the case or not, we do need empirical data to demonstrate that. So uh, it's it's difficult for me to make speculations here without seeing the data. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor. We still have lots of questions and we hardly have five minutes left. So let me try to plug a few more questions. What steps in Ch is China taking to improve its image in the United States in particular and in West in general? Well, oh, I think China has done many things over the past over the past years. I mean, if you remember, China has been doing lots of things in 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 in, in this kind of global PR campaign to to do many things to improve its image overseas. Uh, if you still remember, uh, I uh, 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 five uh, six or five years ago, there is a big ad played in New York Times Square. Uh, uh, showing the, these kind of portraits of celebrities in China uh, from different fields. And also China has been trying to continue this kind of public diplomacy between the US and China, uh, taking advantage of these kind of non-political, non-governmental channels to facilitate this communication between the two societies, right? We all know better communication leads to less misunderstanding and can facilitate this kind of um, kind of mutually positive feelings among people. But it's quite unfortunate that, uh, that in, the past, uh, in the past five or six years, that kind of channels has been uh, blocked to some extent. So that kind of communication has been uh, interrupted, uh, uh, primarily uh, uh, from the US side. And you see they, they kind of sanction many of these channels and to say that they cannot be visited and used. And China has also been trying to promote its culture and its, uh, its historical kind of heritage and richness through various institutes uh, 
teaching Chinese overseas, right? So uh, holding exhibitions, exhibitions overseas. And I think to some extent that played out in the data we see. So the people who hold more positive views of China's cultural heritage, especially in the US, particularly in the US, they hold a more positive overall image of China. And this is particularly significant among the Democrats. Uh, so I think China has been primarily doing through these non-governmental uh, channels and a mechanism focusing on the cultural dimensions. And China has also been doing a lot in the international forums to explain and to demonstrate China's real intentions, right? What we would like to do. We want to have um, a, a establish a universal common good for everyone. We want everyone to benefit from this. Right? We do not want to be the hegemon as someone see China wants to be, right? But to, so, to what extent these explanations and the PR campaigns can be effective is another thing. And the perceptions really matters here because what you try to deliver, what the message that you try to send, to some extent it could be significantly colored by other people's predispositions and beliefs. So this is, this is the key issue here. But uh, the, that kind of bias, as we can see, and especially in the public opinion data we collected here, can be significantly fine among American people, especially among Republicans, as you can see, right? They say China should be the enemy, they're not our allies. So I, 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 on the one hand, I do see Chinese government has been doing a lot to try to improve that, but that is not just a one-way game. That is kind of a two-way game and it's interactions between China and uh, the other societies, yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor. Let me uh, share the last set of questions, trying to club two or three questions. Do you think that the, that the image of China will be improved during Biden administration as it was seen deepest low during Trump administration? And the last is how successful is China's public diplomacy in the US as, as well as US public diplomacy in China? Well, this, this is an interesting question. So the first one is about making speculations, right? So once I get the data from the, mo the last most recent civil I can come back to you with more findings to see whether that administration has done something good about it. But if we take the most uh, consistent funding from the American politics literature find to pu public opinion, is significant shaped and manipulated by the elites, then the question is the extent to which we find that kind of swift or change in the elites political discourses toward China, so with the change from uh, Trump to the Biden administration. But if you simply review the coverage from New York Times, from Washington Post, Wall Street Journals, but I, I, I don't think you'll find a very significant change in terms of their coverage about China related issues, like the COVID-19 vaccines, right? Things like that. So if you do not see that kind of change at the elite level, and you see the block, of the public diplomacy channels for that kind of communication. Me, if you ask me to make speculation, you ask me to guess, I don't think there'll be an easy or swift change in how American view China in a positive way. So that's, so if I give you optimistic or pessimistic assessment, I probably will bet on the pessimistic side to say, okay, this is not an easy thing to, to, be, to be addressed. The second part is about what U.S. did in China and what China did in the U.S., right, in terms of shaping their people's views of the other society. Uh, I don't know much about what the U.S. government did in, uh, what the U.S. government does in China, but at least most recently when the American embassy in China uh, reopened that uh, their visa sort of application process, especially for international students, for Chinese students. You know, Chinese students used to be a major component of foreign students in China. And they blocked the, the, that service because of the COVID-19 situation, that not to reopen it because of China has been controlling that kind of situation very effectively. They sent a message in public uh, comparing, now it's saying, okay, welcome back to, uh, welcome back to the US, uh, but the ad and the noticing is like the dogs has been inside for so long, they're looking for happy times outside. So that could be a, a, an unintended message for 
for them for their public diplomacy, but that message has been interpreted in very different ways online in China. People perceived quite bad intentions of the message. So I don't know. I mean, that part, if it interacted with the social dynamics, if it interacted with the predispositions held by many of the netizens or people in these societies, the effectiveness of that kind of government engaged or government lead diplomacy may not necessarily be that kind of significant. It may backfire. So that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, Professor Jelu, thank you very much for your valuable time. It was a really interesting discussion and we learned a lot. Thank you for joining us in spite of your busy schedule. We'd like to have you at NICE again in the future. Hope to see you in Rio very soon, maybe in Beijing or in Kathmandu. I would also like to thank all our participants for their participation and interesting question. Please do join our next event. Thank you very much and have a nice day.